Nigeria's national power grid has collapsed multiple times this year, with the most recent failure occurring on October 14th, 2024. This marks the seventh collapse of the grid in 2024, underscoring the fragility of the country's power infrastructure. The incident led to widespread blackouts, disrupting businesses, industries, and households across the country. The grid, which usually generates around 4,000 megawatts for a population of over 200 million people, completely lost power due to a system disturbance at one of, at one of the transmission stations. These recurrent collapses highlight deeper issues within Nigeria's power sector, including aging infrastructure, insufficient maintenance, and underinvestment. Despite government efforts and promises to revamp the system, the national grid continues to operate beyond its capacity. Experts have pointed to the need for significant upgrades to the transmission network, increased investment in power generation, and better management to prevent future collapses. Joining us to provide insights into the frequent collapses of Nigeria's national power grid and explore potential solutions for stabilizing the system is former chairman of the Presidential Task Force on Power Sector, Engineer Bex Dagogojak. Good morning, Engineer Dagogojak. Good to have you join us on the morning show today. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, sir. I just well. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, joining us. Let's talk power and the incessant collapse of the national grid of Nigeria. And as you're aware, everybody experienced it. It was the seventh time uh, during the week when the, power, when the national grid collapsed again. Um, I'd like to quickly give you a bit of statistics that I'm sure, or, or just to remind you, because I know that you know this very well, so that that can serve uh, as the point in which you can you know, properly um, uh, give us a, your perspective on why we are where we are today. Seventh time this year. Um, between 2000 and 2022, reports say that Nigeria's power grid uh, collapsed uh, a total number of 564 times, out of which, under the eight years of Buhari alone, 99 times. Engineer Dagogo Jack, why is this the situation? Even though people will point at what is happening, you know, lately in Cuba, where the national grid also collapsed and they're just, you know, crawling their way out of it. Why are we susceptible to this type of uh, inconvenience to Nigerians all the time? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. You put it very clearly. Um, um, it's not something to celebrate because... Some effort was put in to correct this situation, but I would say we took our eyes off the ball. But let me go to your point directly. Number one is we don't have enough electricity. We can have 4,000, 5,000 megawatts for 100, 200 million people. 200 million people growing at about 2%, 2.5% per annum needs not less than another 50,000 megawatts that is also growing at the population growth rate. Now, can you imagine 50,000 uh, megawatts is what we need, but we are on about 5,000 megawatts, barely scratching 10%. It's very similar to a family of 15 that has only three cups of rice per day, and you're wondering why people have kwashoko, why people have uh, malnutrition why people are collapsing. That is the situation we are confronting. For me, that is the root cause. The root cause is that we don't have enough electricity to go around, and the system that will convey this electricity is permanently stressed. Permanently stressed. We should even commend and encourage the, the hands that are dealing with this situation. The system operator, the ground, the ground team on the lines, the ground team at the substations, the feeder station, we have to appreciate that they are working with little or nothing to deliver what they are delivering. So the root cause is that we don't have enough electricity for a country as huge as we are. That's the root cause. There are other 
uh, immediate causes that anyone looking at the system would see. Uh, there are other immediate causes. I also believe that the, one of the immediate causes is the fact that we have not done what we should do so far as pricing is concerned. By way of priority, I'll put more priority on electricity than I will put on petrol, which we have completely uh, uh, level, levelized, if you like, by way of cost. But a situation where you don't have fully reflective cost in electricity, you are marooning this, the, the industry. You're marooning the market. The market is behaving abnormally. So to that extent, you can't expect so much from a market that is abnormal. But I've, I've emphasized that our root cause is lack. We don't have enough. The other cause is that we don't have enough redundancy. You can't operate an electricity grid without enough redundancy at the generation as well as the transmission levels. At the generation level, by redundancy, I mean spinning reserve. You have to have the amount you export for the day, and you have to have another idle power waiting to deal with stresses on the grid that you cannot predict. So when that happens, your spinning reserve comes to the aid. By 2014, we were doing 4,800 exported daily, and we had 300 megawatts of spinning reserve waiting to if you like, jump into spaces where we need, we have problems, frequency issues, current issues, all other issues that uh, a system develops if it is stressed. But in, at the transmission level, we have to have what we call the, you know, the N plus one redundancy or N minus one contingency. These technical uh, parameters specify that a transmission grid must have options it can fall back to when the system is stressed, either by going on an alternative line or just switching back to a double line that you put in case something goes wrong with the first line. We don't have any of those things. We, we can't, you can't run a, a transmission grid on one corridor serving so many people. You're just overloading the system and any one of the equipments on that system can pack up. Yes, Another sir. point is that we don't have enough communi communication control on the system, what we call SCADA, super, super, supervisory control and data acquisition system. It is in increasing, the technology for it is improving every day in such a way that there is perfect handshake and data exchange between generation, transmission, distribution, and you can immediately step into a 10 minute delay in that communication is enough to lead to system collapse. Yeah. Engineer so these are the elements that is messing up things. Yes, yeah. Engineer, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Now, I want to ask because mm -hmm. you are an advisor, I believe, in the Good Luck Jonathan administration, and the Minister for Power, um, Bio Adelabu, recently said that some of our transmission equipment are 60 years old, 50 years old. I want to ask if there were no incentives to replace some of these items even during your time on the presidential task force. And also now, um, if the solutions to Nigeria's great problems are not off-grid solutions like solar, renewables, or mini-grid solutions. He, the Minister of Power did talk about regional grids, but it does seem like particularly when the global north is moving towards uh, energy transition, clean energy and renewables, that mini-grid solutions have been seen to have some success in, in rural Nigeria. So do you think that that might be a solution for us in order to reduce energy poverty in Nigeria and also just uh, going back to the transmission issues, the equipment that are 60, 50 years old, uh, why, was there a lack of incentive to replace them even in your um, administration, the administration you were part of? Thank you, Adiswa. Um, your point about how much investment was put into the sector under the Good Luck Administration, and you can fact check this, we had 477, 4,775 projects. So I'm talking 4,775 projects under the National Integrated Power uh, PP. Of the 4,700 projects, about 3,000 of it were transmission line projects. 
Without those projects, I can tell you for free that we'll be dealing with 1,000 megawatts uh, per day instead of the 5,000 that we're able to do as we speak. Even at that time, we delivered 11,000 megawatts of electricity by 2014. As of today, about more than half of it is redundant, is not in utilization. So again, you want to put, put the facts right. What is going on? How come 2014 to 2023, we couldn't take up the electricity that have been constructed, that is on ground, that is working? All it needed was to structure it properly and let it begin to deliver power to the system. Even if we had 1,000 megawatts of spinning reserve, 1,000 per day, we won't have these collapses because the collapses arise from the challenges of overstressing the line by different dynamics in the power equation. And this, uh, most of them are attended to when you have enough uh, reserve to interfere, intervene in, at the different levels. But we don't have that. So th that is just addressing how well the Good Luck Administration focused on power. Because at the time, there was already a situation in which the NIPP had been grounded. And uh, there were issues of whether it, there was corruption or no corruption. And there were probe and no probe. But Good Luck came in there, cleared all those uh, rubbish, and said, see, we need the power. We have the money. It's been committed. We took it from the state's uh, excess crude account. Let's use it and deliver what we can deliver. So you have a lot of projects that were delivered at generation level, transmission level, distribution level, gas level. Gas investments were delivered. And the projects are there for all to see. Now, but immediately after 2014, 2015, it served some people's interest to, to treat power sector as a political issue. And then they took their eyes off the ball, and we are where we are today. Talking about mini grids, I agree with you, but it's not so much about mini grids as it is about empowering the states to do what the new Electricity Act of 23 has empowered them to do. Because each subnational has far more capacity and leverage to add to the electricity uh, supply than, say, mini grid, which is a small business. Uh, businesses and private sector people who need so much help and financing one way or the other. So I would rather we focus on getting the 36 states and committing them to a certain level of power addition per state. Now, if you aggregate all of that, it will come to a level that will take a lot of pressure off the national grid and begin to give the kind of uh, comfort that people should feel that they are living in a modern system where Nepal doesn't just smile and frown at them in, in, as, as it likes. All right, Engineer, uh, thanks uh, for that. Uh, two uh, related questions from me uh, here. Uh, first is uh, for you to um, you know, e expand your thoughts on the reasons why uh, uh, we're still dealing with these issues. I recall that in 2022, uh, during the Buhari administration, part of the reasons uh, that the federal government gave uh, for the incessant uh, power grid collapse uh, was low, low gas power generation as a result of sabotage of gas pipelines. But you see, uh, that's also in spite of uh, the about 1.52 trillion Naira bailout uh, that the Buhari administration gave uh, to, you know, uh, uh, in rescuing uh, the power sector and by extension, of course, the, the power grid. So when you say uh, repeatedly that we dropped the ball and that, you know, that there was a lacuna uh, between the time that good Lord Jonathan left and, and where we are now. Um, what is truly responsible? Uh, second part of the question will be that I, I, I reference what is happening in Cuba uh, at this point in time. Um, would you think that um, uh, like Cuba, like Nigeria, that this has to do with um, a kind of, you know, socialism where uh, a government gives out, uh, gives away a lot more freebies in terms of, you know, appropriate pricing uh, for power usage. Thank you, Steve. Um, the Nigerian power sector reform program, as was um, um, given power to, given a life to by the Good Luck Administration, was very clear. 
and the documents are there, both digitally and on, in paper form. You will see a roadmap that is laid out clearly. There is a rollout from stage to stage after privatization handover. After handover, we uh, mature the market, mature the market, and begin to gear the market to different levels of, uh, if you like, efficiency. None of that was was uh, embraced by the last administration. It was only when the negative impact of not embracing the roadmap confronted government. A government started throwing money at it, and you have mentioned the figures. A lot of money, but ask me, correlate that money to where we are today. We're exactly where we are before the money, 4,000 megawatts. So I begin to wonder, do you want to argue that there was no value for that kind of injection? So to, to, to the extent that you didn't follow a program that had been laid out. Back in the day, when we were much younger, there used to be five-year rolling plan. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, disseminated down the ministries. Every ministry. So if everybody followed their plan, you see that the country was growing at a pace. And everybody was in tandem. So once it's off, it's a start. People who took the uh, all right, um, uh, Engineer Dagogo Jack, I'm sorry we're experiencing some technical glitch there. Uh, we will, uh, I believe, quickly go on a short break and see if we can rectify that and come back to you. You welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News, and we're still on uh, with the former chairman of the Presidential Tax Force on Power Sector. Engineer Bex Dagogo Jack. Thanks, Engineer, for staying with us. Um, I will allow you to land on your thoughts, uh, the points you were making earlier, and to also address the second uh, part of my question regarding, uh, like Cuba, like Nigeria, and if this has anything to do with socialism, or you know, um, you know, in terms of how much uh, people are willing to pay uh, for power. Thank you, Steve. I think I also want to make the point that um, whilst the facts, facts are sacred, we don't have time to uh, cry over spilled milk. What has happened has happened. I think thoughts should harmonize, thoughts should focus on the way forward. How do we fix this going forward? So most of the contribution that we should, the conversation we should have is how do we go to the next level of. Um, the past should not be uh, mocked up by people uh, without the facts. I mean, the story, rather. The narrative should not be mocked up by mm. people who don't have the facts. That's why I was uh, pushed to make those facts. Talking about Cuba, you know, we, we have actually distanced the market, the electricity sector, from that approach you are talking about by the reform. The, we had separated electricity sector from government intervention and interference. Engineer Dagogo Jack, I'm afraid we will have to leave it there given the struggle that we have had uh, with uh, connection on your part. But thanks for the insight that you've brought into the subject matter today.